Good morning and welcome to our introduction to Stereo Investigator webinar. Happy you could join us today. I uh, hope everyone's doing well and staying healthy. My name is Nathan Lee. I'm the product manager for Stereo Investigator. Today I'm joined by Ira Gardner Morse. He's a senior member of our training and support staff. Ira, how are we doing today? Pretty good, Nate. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. Thanks. Um, Today, uh, we're going to be going through an introduction to Stereo Investigator and its most commonly used features. This is by no means an exhaustive overview of everything you can do with Stereo Investigator. So if you have questions, uh, you know, please send them in. We'll try to answer them, but uh, we may also refer you to other webinars where we go more in depth with some of the other features. Um, so why don't we go to the next slide, Ira? I just want to do a brief overview of what we're going to be covering today for everybody. Um, so to start off with, we're going to do some stereology background and theory, uh, and then we're going to get into the basics of the microscope integration and talk a little bit about some of the hardware that we integrate with. Uh, and then after that, we're going to take a, a basic look at the MBF Bioscience user interface and introduce everybody to that. Once you get used to one of our applications, you'll find that most of the other ones are pretty familiar. So um, it's it's nice to be able to, to see that. Um, and then we'll get into running the optical fractionator workflow, uh, followed by the Cavalieri estimator, and then we'll pull some results out. And to, to finish things up, uh, we're gonna do some image acquisition. And one of my favorite features is the slide scanning. Um, so that'll allow us to take multiple fields of view and stitch all that together into one image. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of what we're looking to cover today. Um, and before we, we move forward, I wanted to just uh, share with everybody how to submit a question. Um, we're really happy to take questions. This is one of the, the best opportunities we have to interact with, with our users and everything. So um, please send us questions. Um, and to do that, open up the GoToWebinar console um, that you should have as when you join the webinar and go ahead and click on the orange arrow and that'll expand it. And then you can go to the question tool panel, type your question in the box and click send. Um, this also, this webinar will be recorded. It's gonna be available on our website. So if you can't stick with us for the whole hour, um, you know, we'll have that. You can come back and, and see what you missed. And you can also refer a colleague to, to the webinar if, if you see something that they think would be interesting. Um, so why don't we, talk a little bit, uh, why don't we get into some bias, Ira? Yeah, so the whole point of what Stereo Investigator can do, uh, the whole point of stereology is that you wanna have unbiased quantification, unbiased estimates for stuff. And, and bias is a little bit of a tricky concept, and I think it's probably easiest to show this with an example. So what we've got here is some tissue that's been cut up into different sections. Uh, and you might, in the traditional, in the biased approach to cell counting, the, the approach that we're trying to avoid with Stereo Investigator, you might pick one of these sections and then you might count what's there. So if we were to pick, uh, as an example, let's say this uh, section right here, and you were to go and, and count the cells that you see in this section, if you were to look only at this particular section, you'd count one, two, and then three cells in this section. Now, the problem with that, as you can quickly see from this figure, is that you're not actually counting cells. You're counting cell pieces, cell cross-sections. You're counting uh, half cells, fragments of cells, as though they're entire cells. And so while there are actually eight cells in this tissue, when you go to count it using a biased quantification technique, we're going to count more cells than are actually there. We're going to count 12 cells. So that's what bias is. Bias is if you were to repeat this experiment an infinite number of times, you would converge on a number, but that number would not necessarily be the true number. And the problem with bias uh, is that it's very dependent on your protocols and your techniques. So if you were to, for example, section this tissue in a different orientation, now you'd be counting some of these cells in one to three different sections. And so instead of uh, 12, we count 20 cell profiles. And remember that there's actually still only eight cells in this piece of tissue. So that's really, I think, what, what bias is. Ira, I've heard the term um, used a lot with stereology, give a cell the chance to be counted once and only once. Is that, that kind of go along with, with removing yes, bias? Yes, it absolutely does. The idea behind cell counting with stereology specifically is that you do want to give each cell an equal chance to be counted once and only once. And in this technique that's shown here in this figure, we're counting some of these cells multiple times. So it's not unbiased counting. Biased techniques like these may be precise, but they're not accurate. And accuracy is the most important thing when you're doing science. 
So let's talk a little bit more about the difference between precision and accuracy. So here's an example that we're going to use, and this is a, a metaphor that's not perfect, but it's a pretty good way of demonstrating precision and accuracy. So we've got a target, and we're trying to throw darts at that target. And if you had a method, an approach that was precise, you would always be hitting in the same location on that, that target, that dartboard. So here, in this example, the example that we showed on the previous slide where we're counting cells, we're very consistently counting either 8 or 12 cells, depending on the section orientation. Um, but we're missing the target, right? We're a uh, distance away from that, and we don't have any sort of way to quantify to know how far away from the target that we are. So that is non-stereological counting. It may be precise, but it's not accurate. So it's very hard to compare your results with those of other researchers. Here's another example using the same uh, target representation. This example is both precise and accurate, right? We're very consistently throwing those darts and we're very consistently getting near to the target. So this is kind of the ideal that we would like to shoot for. And this is something that stereology allows you to do. Now, the problem is stereology, like many other good scientific techniques, is a lot of work. It's very time consuming. It's very labor intensive. And so what if we could get the same accuracy that we need to get results that we have confidence in, but we could back off on the precision a little bit? And so what you can do is you can optimize your stereology, and there are many papers written on this, and there are tools available in Stereo Investigator that will help you to figure out exactly how to optimize your stereology parameters. What if we could optimize our stereology to be accurate, to be around the center of that, that tar target and, and get the results that we need, uh, but we could back off on the precision just enough? Uh, to, to optimize the amount of work that we're doing. So this is sort of the ideal uh, that we would, we're shooting for when we do stereology, is to be accurate, even if we're not necessarily precise. So the important thing to remember with stereology is that if you repeat the experiment an infinite number of times, as long as your quantification methods are unbiased, on average, over an infinite number of probe runs or an infinite number of dart throws, you would converge on the true number, even if they're not necessarily precise, they will be accurate. So now we talked a little bit about some of the theory behind running, doing stereology. What can we do with Stereo Investigator and the stereological probes that are included in it? Um, stereology has a lot of ways to look at stuff, which we call probes. There are probes to look at cell populations um, that be using the optical fractionator or physical fractionator. Um, you could run the Cavalieri estimator to get a regional volume, such as the volume of the thalamus. You could run the nucleator probe to get uh, an estimate of cell size. You could run the space balls probe to get an estimate of length or a modified uh, optical fractionator. And there's many more. So let's launch the software so we can introduce the interface and show how to use their investigator. Um, and before we do that, we'll need to talk about the hardware. So here is a picture of a typical uh, stereo investigator system. We've got the, the base of it is a upright microscope. Um, you can run upright or inverted. Uh, and this one is set up for both bright field and fluorescence. Uh, you see we have a motorized stage, which is accompanied by a stage controller and a joystick that move that stage in a repeatable manner. Um, we've got a, a color camera and a fluorescent camera. Um, and then we have, this system has an apatome on it, which is a structured illumination device, which provides uh, confocal-like images. Uh, it's a really neat uh, instrument. And so we've got a little video here of turning on each of the uh, components. So you can kind of see what that's like and uh, how to power up a system. So we're just going through each component, powering that on and letting that initialize. Uh, and you'll want the com individual components to be on for a good 30 seconds before you start the program. And so we're just going through the microscope stand, the light source, the stage controller, and each of these has their own kind of startup routine. It's nice to kind of see this if uh, for folks that haven't run this before, um, just so you see, you know, what the process is like. Um, if, you, if you're not familiar with the components, it, it's nice to just uh, to have a view to that. You'll notice the lights will cut flash and that indicates that they're initializing. So Ira, what do you say we uh, power up our system and start up the program? Sounds good. So to begin, I'm going to double click the Stair Investigator desktop shortcut, and then I'll select my group and then the profile. Ira, what's the purpose of these? 
So groups and profiles are a fantastic way to organize the settings that you have in Stereo Investigator, either by lab or by project or by person in your lab. So you can see that I've got different settings in here that we've set up for different projects that I'm working on just to keep different users and different projects from interfering with each other's settings or configurations. So for this particular project, I'm going to select the profile that's set up to use it and then click OK and Stereo Investigator will launch and it will read in those settings. So Ira, those profiles seem like they could be really useful in a core setting or if a system was shared amongst a couple labs? Definitely. That's exactly what we designed them for. So the first problem that we are going to here is that we can't actually see anything. So Nate, when the screen is all black like we're seeing here, what are some steps that you might take to troubleshoot a problem like that? So if you're having difficulty getting a live image on your screen, you want to do is just take a step back and think about your light path as it goes through the microscope. You want to start back at the light source itself and just travel through the base of the microscope, passing through any filters or apertures that may be in the light path. You want to make sure those are open or in the correct position for the imaging mode that you're in. Then you want to open up um, your field diaphragm as you come up through. And then your condenser, obviously, when you're working, you want to be in good color illumination. But for the purposes of just achieving a live image and seeing something on the screen, you can just open things up to make sure that you're getting light. So as you move through the condenser, and then you'll move through your, up to your tissue, through the tissue, into your objectives. And then you'll reach, in most cases, some additional filters. And you want to make sure those are in the correct position, uh, typically bright field. And then you get up to your Trinoc head, where you can either go up to the eyepieces or to your camera. So that's when the light path selector uh, comes into play. And nine times out of 10, if somebody has the problem, I can't see anything on my screen, it's with the light path selector. So slide this into the correct position to allow light to go up to your camera and you're good. So really what we're doing here is just think about the basics, follow your light path, open things up and you'll be good. Ira, now that we have the light path all set in the microscope, what should we check in the software? So there are a few things in the software that you'll want to check. And in that software, you want to click on the Acquire tab up here. And then the first thing to do is to make sure that the camera is communicating with the software, which you can do by clicking on the Live Image button right here. And in this case, that was all we needed to do, uh, was just turn the live image on in order to get a live image on the screen. There are a couple of other things to check, and those are the Camera Settings window, where you want to make sure that you have an exposure time that's reasonable but not too high. Generally, for bright field work, that means less than 100 milliseconds. And then make sure that your camera histogram is set up correctly. And for bright field work, you almost always want to have that set to the default settings, which are use the full histogram window. So at this point, we've got an image up on the screen, and we're ready to go and begin the optical fraction of your workflow. Before we get into the optical fraction, let's briefly introduce the interface so everyone's comfortable with how to get around. As Ira mentioned, we've got the Acquire tab here. Um, we'll move over to the left and just briefly talk about the probes, and we'll run through those really quickly. So we've got the probes tab. These are the probes to run Stereo Investigator. This is really the basis of the program. Um, we have all the probes organized by what you're looking for. So if you're looking for a number, Click on that and you'll see the optical fractionator, physical fractionator, and you can go through each of these categories to see, um, you know, what probe is recommended for or is going to look for those particular items. Uh, you also have the probe run list here, which is where you get your data um, once you've run the probe. The next tab is the trace tab. That's where you go when you want to trace something. You can select your the region or the contour type that you want, and there's some other options in there as well. Uh, the Move tab is moving around, just what it says. Uh, we really tried to make these as obvious and as possible and make it just really, really easy to use and jump in. Acquire is acquiring an image and adjusting that live image as you see it. Uh, image tab is making adjustments to an already acquired image and moving around, things like that. You got the Publish tab. Uh, you can add text. You can add a scale bar. You can export. and. Then finally, the workspace tab is just where you find all of the separate um, docking windows to set up your, your workspace. So how you want to work, the things that you need to do what, you're, what you need to work on. Um, and lastly, we've got a search, which if you can't find the thing that you need, uh, like if you need the, the 3D window, um, for instance, you could click up, you could click up there and, and search for that. Um, and it also tells you 
um, which tab to find that on. So it's in the trace. Um, so this is a, that's a really handy feature, um, both for folks that are used to the old interface or people that are new to the software um, that can't find, you know, the Z meter, for instance, or the ortho view. Um, so it's, it's really handy. The search also will allow you to search for particular settings. Um, so if you wanted to search for, you know, how do I move with my mouse wheel, move my Z axis with the mouse wheel, you can you can find that setting here. Um, so it's it's really handy uh, to get around. That way you don't need to find. Well, I think this was in you know options preferences blah blah blah. You just you do a search and you find what wow, you want. Wow, that's super helpful. Um, so we really tried to make that as easy as possible. All right, Ira, let's start up that optical fractionator. Everyone's waiting for it. All right. So to launch the optical fractionator, we'll go to the probes tab here, and then because it's a number probe, we're trying to count. We'll select optical fractionator workflow. Now, the optical fractionator workflow is like a wizard or a guide that takes you through every step of the process and makes sure that you're not forgetting anything important. So to begin, let's just follow the steps that it says. We're going to select Start a New Subject, and then we'll click OK. And now on the first step of the workflow here, we'll enter some information about the subject. So these are things like your name or the animal's number or any notes that you have about the subject. Really, I think the most important thing that we're setting up on step one of the workflow here is the section information. So we want to enter the number of sections that we have to count, the section's cut thickness, which is the block advance on your vibratome or microtome, whatever you section with, and then the section evaluation interval, which is a 1 in 12 series for this subject. And then once we've entered that information, we will go ahead on to the next step. Now, on this step, we want to go down to low magnification. And low magnification, at least for bright field, typically means the lowest magnification objective on your system. But for fluorescence, this can be a little trickier. Sometimes you're not able to visualize your tissue super well at uh, 5x or, or 1x or whatever your lowest objective is. So for fluorescent work, sometimes you'll need to work at 10x or 20x as your low magnification or tracing objective. Once we've selected that objective and gone down to low magnification, we can go ahead on to the next step. And this step is the tracing step, where we want to trace our region of interest. So we can select the contour type that we want to trace from this list here. And if you wanted to change the contour name or color or any other options about it, there's these wonderful little gear icons that have been placed throughout the software. We can just click on that and it will open up the relevant options. So in here, we can change the contour type or contour color if we wanted to. Once we've got the contour selected, I'll move around. And you can move around using either the joystick or the arrow keys, whichever's easier for you. And we'll locate the region of interest that we want to trace. Let's go ahead and start tracing it. So Ira, as you move to the left or outside that dotted white box, it looks like things are moving as you do that? Yeah, the white dotted box that you can see on the screen here is the auto move box. And when you click outside of that, the software will move the stage and it will keep your tracings aligned with the slide. That's assuming it's properly calibrated, of course. So that seems like it's, it's pretty useful uh, to be able to work in multiple fields of view and then to be able to come back to that location. Definitely, it is for sure. So now that I've completed tracing this contour, I want to go ahead and close the contour, which tells their investigator this is a contour outlining a region of interest. It's something that I want to be able to count cells inside of or measure the volume inside of. So go ahead and select close contour. And now in the workflow, we could either trace additional regions of interest on this section or additional sections on this slide, or because I just want to show you guys a quick demonstration of how this works, let's go ahead on to the next step for now. So the next thing to do is to go ahead up to high magnification. And typically for this, you want to select the highest magnification objective that's on your system. And this almost always means an oil objective. Ira, I've got a 40x objective, and that's pretty good. Like, I can see my cells. Do I really have to mess with oil in, in like a, a 60 or 100x? It's a mess. It gets all over the place. I've got people in my lab that don't know how to use it. It gets much as my objectives. Uh, do, do I really need oil to do this? Oil can be a pain to work with, but it's actually worth it. And it's extremely important in order to do unbiased stereology and to get results that you have confidence in. 
So we've got this figure here that shows a couple of cells that are right on top of each other. And with a low magnification objective, like 10x, 20x, or even 40x, you look at that and it's kind of like all your tissues in focus or none of it is. You see just a single cell that's there and you don't can't make out the cells that are directly above or below that larger cell. But if you're willing to put oil on your slide, and you should be if you want to get good results, then you can actually focus up and down through your tissue and you have a much thinner depth of field. That's what that high numerical aperture from the immersion media gets you. You'll be able to focus up and down and you'll be able to distinguish the bottom of that small cell from the top of the larger cell here. We've got this nice little table that shows you the approximate depth of field that you have at different objectives. And you can see that there's a, a pretty big jump in how small your depth of field is between the 40x air objective with a 1.95 numerical aperture and the 60x or the 100x uh, 1.0 or 1.4 numerical aperture. So yes, it is extremely important to use oil. That's one of the most common problems that we see with ster new stereology users. So it's almost like if we're not using oil, we're not giving each cell a chance to be counted once and only once. Exactly, that's the problem. Now we've gone up to our high magnification oil objective, so we're ready to go on to the next step. On this step, step five, measure mounted thickness, we want to select the default options almost all the time. So those are measure the mounted thickness while counting and measure the mounted thickness at sampling sites and then select every one site. We'll go ahead on to the next step. And now we want to define the counting frame size. And I think this is easiest to do when we're over the region of interest that we are. So let's go ahead and move around. One of the easiest ways to move around in Stair Investigator is using this window called the Macro View window. In that Macro View, we can right click and select Go To, and then click on an area to instantly move to that area. So now we're over our tissue, and I'm defining the size of the counting frame here. Uh, typically, for most projects, you want to have the counting frame contain more or less, give or take, uh, three to five cells in it. So we've got a few more than that here. Uh, so that's okay. This might be a little bit large, but I'm going to go with uh, 40 by 40 uh, frame frame size here. And let's go ahead on to the next step. Now, this step, step seven, the SRS grid layout is one of the most important steps in the entire workflow because it determines the amount of work that you're going to do in your project. So here I'm entering a grid size and the grid size will determine the number of sites that I visit. So if I enter a smaller grid size like 100 by 100, you can see that I'm doing quite a lot more work. If I enter a larger grid size like 1000 by 1000, you'll see that I'm doing a lot less work. Now it's important to understand that when you're changing these numbers, you're also controlling the overall accuracy of your experiment. When you're trying to decide what grid size to use, you should think back to that slide that we put up a few slides ago that was on precision versus accuracy. Now, your results are always going to be accurate. That is, they're always going to be centered around the target, but the grid size allows you to have direct control of the precision. So here's an example that shows doing lots and lots of work or counting the same animal multiple times with a very small grid size. And you can see that these dots or these population estimates from this one subject that we've counted multiple times are all nicely clustered right around the target or the true number of cells that's there. The problem with this approach is that it's very labor intensive and it takes a lot of time. So it's probably a good idea to back off on your parameters a little bit and use a slightly larger grid size than this. So here's an example showing that right here, where you can see that uh, in this target with a slightly larger grid size on it, we've got just a little more variability, a little bit less precision in those population estimates when we recount the same subject over and over again. And it is possible to get too far. Uh, and in here, you might potentially have a real effect between your groups but you've got stereology parameters that are so lax that you're actually masking the real biological effect of your treatment with just poor sampling parameters, too large of a grid size. So Ira, I understand what you're saying here with, you know, we can have a lot of work and get super accurate, super precise, and then, you know, we can even go the other way. 
but how do we find that sweet spot? What's the, you know, if we don't have, you know, a paper we can refer to exactly or, or, or we're not sure, how do we find that, that perfect spot? There's actually a tool in Stereo Investigator called Resample Oversample that allows you to look at a few subjects from each group and compare what the different histograms would look like uh, with different grid sizes and just select the optimal grid size for your particular experiment. That's okay, something so that'll kind of help us. Sorry. So that's that'll help us kind of hone in on, on the right target. Exactly. Perfect. So for this particular experiment, we've decided that the optimal grid size is 400 by 400. So I'll go ahead and enter those numbers here. And then we can go ahead on to the next step. Now in this step, step eight, define dissector options. We're going to set up the height of the tissue that we're going to count inside of. Before we mounted our tissue on the slide, we sectioned it with a cryostat, a vibratome, a microtome, or something like that. And the knife blade from that sectioning device has torn away some of the cells that are at the very top or the very bottom of the tissue. So Ira, is that a way that bias could be introduced into our experiment? It definitely is. If we were to try to count every single cell in our tissue with some of those cells missing, you can't count something that's not there. So we'd underestimate the total cell population in this region of interest. And that is, as you said, bias. That's really bad. So rather than setting the dissector height, that's the area that we're going to count in in the tissue, equal to the total thickness of our tissue, let's have these things called guard zones at the very top and very bottom of the tissue that prevent us from counting these cells that have been torn away. And let's make the dissector height, again, that's the area that we're going to count in in the tissue, just a little bit thinner. And these top and bottom guard zones can be anything from two to five microns in thickness. So they can be pretty thick. For this particular experiment, I know because I've worked with this tissue before, that the top guard zone height should be around five microns. The dissector height, or the area that we're going to count in, should be around 20 microns. And the bottom guard zone should be everything else. So with these settings done, let's go ahead on to the next step. Now on step nine, you can, if you want to, save those sampling parameters. And this provides you just an easy way to, to go back and retrieve those later if you need to, if your PI has a question about the parameters that you use, or if you wanted to recycle these parameters for another subject or another experiment. Finally, we're on to step 10, which is count objects. So this is the step that, unfortunately, you're probably going to spend the most time on if any step in the workflow. I'll hit the green start counting button to begin and then we'll begin counting cells. We're now ready to begin counting cells. We'll start by focusing to the top and the bottom of the tissue to measure the tissue's thickness. I'll focus up in my tissue until there's nothing in focus, and then back down to the very first plane that comes into focus. Then I'll click OK to set the top of the tissue. I'll repeat that process at the bottom of the tissue by focusing down until there's nothing in focus, and then back up until the very first thing anywhere on the screen comes into focus, and that's the bottom of the tissue. Now we've measured the tissue's thickness, which is shown on the right side of the screen on the z-meter. Before we begin actually counting cells, there are a couple of things to talk about. Ira, when we're counting, what are we looking for? How are we going to count these cells? You always want to look for a unique point on the cells to count, and that unique point will ensure that each cell has an equal chance to be counted once and only once. So the unique point can be anything as long as it's unique to that cell. You could use the cell top or the nucleus top or the nucleolus. Again, as long as it's something that the cell only has one of, it's a good criteria that you could potentially use for cell counting. And the way that that unique point gives each cell an equal chance to be counted once and only once is as follows. We'll mark the unique point of a cell if that unique point falls inside the counting frame or touches the green line. If the unique point of the cell touches the red line or falls outside of the counting frame, we're not going to mark that cell. And this is useful because if we were to have another counting frame that was directly adjacent to this one, these cells that we did not mark previously would be marked in this site. Now that we're familiar with the theory behind cell counting, let's take a look and see how this works in practice. 
Stereo Investigator has conveniently focused me to the very top of the dissector, and I'm ready to begin marking cells that are here. Let's take a look at each of the cells that we can see on the screen, and we'll discuss why we should or shouldn't count each one. So let's start with this one right here. It looks to me as I focus up that this cell comes into focus above the top of the dissector in the top guard zone, so I will not mark this cell. Similarly, this cell is also up in the top guard zone. But as I focus down, it looks like there's a cell that the first plane of that cell, the top of that cell, comes into focus right here. So I'll go ahead and place a marker on that cell. Now this is one of the reasons that it's so important to do this work at a high magnification objective because it looks like there's actually another cell right here that we need to mark. You can see there's there's quite a bit going on in this at this counting site. Um, and that's really why we, we said earlier we were sizing our, our counting frame to try to make it so there's between three and five cells. Ira's doing quite a bit of work here to determine, you know, with the counting rules, should he count this, shouldn't he count it? And if we had much more than this, it would get really busy and it would be difficult to tell, you know, should I count this, shouldn't I count it? Did I already check there? I, you know, I can't remember. It's easy, a little turned around. If there was more going on than what we have here, so that's why we try to say that that three to five cells per site, uh, and this helps illustrate that. Great. So I think I've marked all of the cells for this site. Let's go ahead on to the next site and repeat this process. All right. So let's focus up and down and find the top of the tissue and the bottom of the tissue. And again, we're measuring at every site, Ira, just to make sure we have an accurate representation of the thickness of the tissue, correct? Exactly. And we're going to make sure not to mark cells that we see right at the top of the tissue, because the tops of these cells probably are somewhere up in the top guard zone. So again, we do not want to mark those cells. So we could go through and count this whole section, but we um, why don't we get into a little more of the meat here, Ira? Let's let's Why don't we show some results? Yeah, for sure. In the interest of time, let's stop counting these cells and open up a completed data file. And we don't need to save our existing data file here. I'll just open up the completed file. And now let's take a look at some of the results that we get out of this. So to get results, I'll go to the probes tab and then we'll go over to probe run list. And now you can see that there are quite a few probe runs. There's actually a separate one for each section in this data file. And for the moment, I'm only interested in the optical fractionator results. So I'll select the first one, scroll down in this list, hold the shift key, click on the last one, and now I can click view results. Stereo Investigator is going to confirm that the section evaluation interval or the section interval is correct. And I can click OK once I've confirmed that. And now here you can see the results on this screen. So the Probably the one single most important number is the estimated population using mean section thickness. There are a couple of estimates that are given here, um, but I think this is probably the one that most people use most of the time. So this is the total number of cells, and it's just a little bit more than uh, 3 million here that are in this, this particular region of interest. And then you also have a couple of other valuable numbers. I think probably the second most important one is going to be the coefficient of error. Stair Investigator lists several of these. Uh, probably the most commonly used one, I would say, for biological work is the uh, CE Gunderson and then the M equals 1 method value, which is given right here. And again, just remember that the coefficient of error is the distance away from the target that you are more or less. So that's uh, a number that's really only given to you by stereology. It's not something that you will get with any other approach to counting cells. Ira, this is great. Is there an easy way to get these results into Excel? Yes, there actually is a, a fantastic, very easy to use export to Excel button that will create an Excel spreadsheet that has all of your information in it. Okay, so now we're going to pause uh, to take questions on Optical Fractionator. So let me take a look here. We've got a bunch coming in here. Uh, so let's see. All right, Ira. So Stefan asks, how much do I need to count? Ah, so that's a tricky question. Uh, there's not really a, a simple, simple answer for it. Uh, 
it's one of the most common questions that we get asked, I think, so it's probably a good one to answer. Um, if you want a simple answer, if you're counting at least 150 to 200 cells and your CE, your coefficient of error, Gunderson M equals 1 is 0.15 or lower, you're probably counting enough cells. You're probably doing enough work. But as I said, it's a very difficult question to answer with just a, a simple answer. So there is a tool in Stereo Investigator called Resample Oversample, which actually allows you to do what's called a pilot study and count more than you think you need to count on one or two subjects. And then Stereo Investigator will go back and it will resample your data and it will show you how your population estimate changes if you were to do half the amount of work you did or a third or a quarter or, or less. Uh, and so that will allow you to actually dial in your optimal parameters for that particular study. Uh, once again, that is a really tricky question to, to answer, and if that's something that you'd like help with, either using a resample, oversample, or just kind of figuring out how to get started, you're always welcome to reach out to us. You can make a post on our forum, or you can open a case with our support team, uh, and we'd be happy to help you further. Okay, that's great. So let's take the next question. Um, all right, Ira, so this is one about, it looks like hardware. Um, Rebecca asks, will Stereo Investigator work on the microscope that we already have? Probably yes. Stereo Investigator supports all kinds of different microscopes. And uh, now the tricky things are the stage and the camera. So those are, are fantastic questions. If you have a microscope and you're considering upgrading it to work with Stereo Investigator, you're always welcome to reach out to info at mbfbioscience.com and we'd be happy to provide you with a little bit more information about that. All right, so we wanna keep things moving along. If we didn't get to your questions, I'm sorry, I apologize. Please keep, uh, keep sending those in. Um, we, but we did wanna get into our next probe, uh, Ira. So why don't we uh, talk a little bit about Cavalieri? I think it's probably our next most popular probe in Stereo Investigator. Yeah, for sure. The Cavalieri probe is a way to measure the area or most often volume of your entire region of interest. So whereas the optical fractionator was a way to count the total number of cells the Cavalieri probe is really a way to say, how large is my region of interest? So let's take a look at an example here. If you've got your whole region of interest, which is shown in this figure, and you were to section that up into individual sections, you could calculate the total volume if you knew the total, the sum of the cross-sectional areas of each section, and you multiplied that by the average section thickness. And that's it. That's the simple explanation for the Cavalieri estimator. So let's take a look and see how this works on actual tissue. We're back looking at the contour and the data file that we used for the optical fractionator. Now we're going to do the Cavalieri probes. We'd like to estimate the total area and volume that this region of interest occupies. To do that, I'll go to the probes tab up here, and then I'll select under volume and area the Cavalieri estimator. Now this is a pretty simple, straightforward probe to run. Uh, the most tricky part of it is figuring out what the grid spacing, which is equivalent to the grid size in the optical fractionator is. Uh, this is gonna, again, determine the number of cavalry points you place, which you'll see in a moment, and the amount of work that you do. Uh, the rule of thumb that I like to use is to use this measure line tool here and just measure, more or less, the distance across your entire region of interest. So it says that this is around 1,000 microns across. I just like to divide that by 10 and enter 100 here as the grid spacing. And again, it's sort of flexible, the number of points that you need to place, two or 300 per subject would be kind of enough in general. Um, so we'll go ahead and, and fill that out and we'll leave the grid rotation at zero. The section's cut thickness, it looks like it's been imported from the optical fractionator, so that number is correct. And then we'll select a marker and we're ready to begin. So Ira, if, if we had questions about that, or weren't really sure or hadn't run this before, is there a way to get assistance or help on, on how to what these fields mean and how to use this probe? There is scattered throughout Stereo Investigator, there are these little blue question mark buttons. If you click on any of these, Stereo Investigator will open up the context sensitive help and it will give you uh, information about whatever that, that blue button is that you clicked on. So here we're looking at the capillary estimator help and you can see that the help article covers uh, stuff like the theory of how to use the Cavalieri Estimator probe. Uh, it talks about how many marker points you should place, and it will even walk you through the procedure for using the probe uh, in a step-by-step -step manner. 
Ira, this looks great, really helpful and useful, um, but I do notice it's on a website. If I'm on a system or, or at a research facility that doesn't allow internet access, does that mean I don't get access to this? We actually bundle an offline copy of the help with every Stereo Investigator installation. So if you don't have internet access, Stereo Investigator will fall back and it will load the local offline copy of the help that applies to the version of Stereo Investigator that you have installed on your system. Let's go ahead and click OK and begin using the capillary probe. So you can see there's this grid of plus signs that's on the screen here. And what we want to do is we want to paint any plus sign that's over our tissue uh, with a marker just by clicking on it. And you can click and drag to rapidly paint lots of markers. So Ira, I noticed we have this contour here. Is there any way we could use that to just kind of quickly fill this in? Yeah, there is. If you right click, you can choose paint markers into contour which will quickly fill your entire contour, that's the same contour we used for the optical fractionator earlier, with these uh, markers that we've got selected here. And then all you need to do is move around your contour and make sure that all of the markers were correctly placed. And if any were missed, you could paint additional markers here, or if there were any extra ones that should not have been painted, but that were, you can hold the shift key and you can erase those. And actually it looks like it did a pretty good job. I'll just paint a couple extra markers here and then I'll show you how you can erase them just by holding the shift key and clicking and dragging over those. Now, if everything looks good here, we're finished with this section and we can go ahead on to the next section and repeat this process. As with the optical fractionator, I don't want to keep you guys here while we go through this entire process. So let's skip to a completed data file and see what that looks like. Let's go ahead and open up this file. And then just like with the optical fractionator, when I'm getting results, you want to go to probes and then probe run list. And this time you can see there's the capillary estimator probes here. So I'll hold, I click the first one, hold the shift key and click on the last one to select all of those. And then I'll click on the view results button down here to view results. Stereo investigator will ask me to confirm the section evaluation interval that I used is correct there. So I'll go ahead and click OK. And now we're looking at the Cavalieri results. Now there's a couple of results that are given here and usually the most uh, kind of important or relevant one is going to be the estimated volume, uh, which in this case is 17 cubic millimeters for this subject. Just like with the optical fractionator results, there is a coefficient of error number that's also given to you, which is displayed here. And there's also that one-click export to Excel that's super handy. So that wraps up Cavalieri and the stereology portion of, of what we wanted to talk about today. I did want to just touch on one of the other major features in Stereo Investigator, and that's slide scanning. You know, since we are connected to this microscope system, we can acquire images here, and we can acquire really nice images um, they cover multiple fields of view and then stitch those together just like you would on a slide scanner. Okay, so now we're in Stereo Investigator and I wanna talk a little about some of the image acquisition and then we'll get right into the slide scanning. So you can just acquire a single field of view. So that would be the acquire image button. Um, and additionally, you can do um, image stacks. So the entire thickness of the tissue. So go down through and acquire that. Um, you can also acquire SRS image stacks. So that's another feature of Stereo Investigator. So you could count those, um, sorry, so you can acquire those image stacks and then count those offline on a different system. Um, and so that'll give you a nice, very efficient acquisition and data set. And then you can go and take that off the microscope and count that on an offline workstation. Uh, you'll notice as well, there are some image tools. We've got the image organizer. Um, that allows you to see the images that you've captured. Uh, it gives you just a brief summary and a thumbnail of the image. Uh, it also allows you to kind of interact with that image. So really handy features. Uh, why don't we just jump into the slide scanning workflow and we can talk about that and, uh, and acquire some really cool images. So Iris starting up the workflow. Um, so this walks you through what's a relatively complex process, um, but we try to simplify it with the workflow. Um, so we'll start off, the first step is just kind of setting things up. What kind of scan do you want to do? Um, it saves your data file, so it'll save your progress for you. Um, you know, we're going to map a contour, uh, the region that we want to acquire. So we're going to set up a 2D scan. This is obviously Brightfield. 
and we're going to scan within our contour. You can also acquire a fluorescent uh, scan uh, and set up, you know, multi-channel acquire. Uh, you can do a 3D, all kinds of stuff. For, for our purposes today, we're going to keep it simple. We're going to do bright field, 2D, uh, and so I think we can proceed and start tracing. So here we'll go to low magnification and we're just going to trace. Uh, and as you guys remember from earlier, uh, we're going to be utilizing that auto move area. So we can just click to indicate where we want to acquire and, and we'll start tracing. Once we have the, the contour we want, we'll click and this will bring us around the entire, uh, you know, region that you're interested in. And you just trace the software keeps everything lined up and uh, you're able to move. The nice thing about this as well is that it brings you, uh, you can come back to these locations as you're tracing, or once you've finished tracing rather. Um, and it allows you to change magnification as well. So if we wanted to look at something in greater detail, we could go up in magnification and see and easily get back to that same point. Uh, so it's, it's really, really handy. Uh, and it's it, it'll become a critical tool for you as, as you use the system more and more. Uh, so go ahead and we can move on to the next step and that's our acquisition magnification. And so we're going to do a higher, uh, higher power here. So we'll go up to 20 and it's whatever, you know, whatever magnification you want to get whatever detail you need. Things will get a little slower as you uh, go up in power uh, just because you have more sites. So that's just something to keep in mind, but you do get more detail. So this is the background correction step. What that will do for you is give you a nice even field of view. It'll eliminate any seams or tiling or vignetting effects, edge effects. We're going to disable that for, per, for our purposes today, um, but it's, it's a great tool and this step walks you through that process. It's really helpful. Okay, so we can proceed down to the next step. So this is some trimming options. So if you do have some of those edge effects, you can kind of trim that off and fine tune um, your settings. These are the default settings that we have here. We know these work well for this image. So we're going to continue. There's also a sample image. This is something we recommend if you're going to do a really big acquire. Um, it, it just to make sure that all your settings look good. Um, so before you set up an acquire that might run for an hour or two, um, this way you can do a nice small acquire, make sure everything looks good uh, before you really dedicate the time on your microscope to, to acquiring. Uh, so we're gonna skip that for now because we know everything's good and we'll go to our next step. So now we have the focus map. This is where a really powerful feature of the slide scanning. What Ira's doing now is he's indicating different places on the tissue where we're going to focus. As you're probably familiar, your tissue is not flat, um, especially when we're up at high magnification. And we talked about that earlier in the webinar when uh, we were counting. And so we're gonna go to different sites throughout the tissue to bring things into focus. And what the software will do is build a map of, of what the surface of the tissue looks like in terms of the, the Z position. So as you can see, Ira is focusing here. You can see the focus meter change as he kind of focuses and moves through the tissue. And so we're gonna focus on all these sites that he indicated. Um, if there's places you know that are particularly wavy, you're gonna want to add more sites there. Um, if, if your tissue is pretty uniform, you can probably get away with less sites. It's something you can kind of fine tune as, as you know your tissue the best. You'll notice down in the status bar, we're at site 10 of 12, and now we're at 11. And so that's just a handy place where you can see your progress. And we're at our last focus site. So now you can see we've got this really great map of, you know, the surface of the tissue. And we can proceed once once that looks good. There is this heat map feature, which is really handy if you have many many sites. If you it'll, what this will do is it will indicate places that are um, over that exceed this threshold that we've set. We set this to two just to illustrate. Oh, this is kind of a bigger jump. You might want to take a look at that. Um, it's really helpful for uh, identifying potential problems. You know, five microns is a perfectly fine threshold. Um, so we'll go with that for now, um, but it's really handy feature. And now we can start counting or start scanning, excuse me. We will um, just set a file name for the image file. We set the uh, data file earlier, and now we'll do the image file and start scanning. So this will scan. We've got a pretty fast setup here. So this will run through and acquire. <clears throat> So once we have this acquired, 
This will show up in our image organizer and we can take it off to other systems. You can share it with colleagues. Um, you can do analysis on an offline system that's not on the microscope. Um, it's great for archival purposes if you want to kind of come back to something later uh, or if you have a question about something, it's, it, it's really very handy uh, to be able to do this. Some folks even use a low power scan when they're counting uh, in optical fractionator. They'll run a low power scan and they'll have this as a reference image. So you kind of see this in the macro view. We have that one image we acquired at first and it's, it's very handy. You'll see as we bring this finished image up, it's nice to be able to see that macro image, um, kind of just a quick glance at what we have. So here's our final image. It looks great. You can't really see any seams or tiles or edge effects. Um, so, so we've acquired a, a great image here, and uh, you know now we can we can uh, take a look. We'll inspect this a little closer, and uh, yeah, it looks pretty good. We can move around through the macro view as well, just kind of jump around and see the image. And uh, we're it looks like that was a pretty good acquire. So I think we're we're good with that. And we've got the image organizer as well. You'll notice the scan is loaded in there and you can see that's much larger you can see the pixel resolution so that's a, a large image relative to just the single uh tile and obviously the thumbnail is indicative of that as well um looks great thank you and that is the slide scanning workflow okay so that pretty much wraps, wraps things up uh why don't we take a quick break and we'll uh pause for questions um and so feel free to send those over and i'll take a look here what do we have all right, here's one. Uh, Ira, Praveen asks, our tissue has shrunk quite a bit. What is the minimum thickness you need to run optical fractionator? Ah, so this is a pretty common question that we, we get often. Uh, unfortunately, as with a lot of other stereology questions, there's not a single simple answer to it. Um, I, because I know you're looking for a simple answer. Uh, the simplest one is your mounted thickness of your tissue needs to be as thick as you can possibly get it while still having complete penetration of the stain all the way through your tissue. That is, you can't count something if you can't see it. So you've got to be able to see every cell in your tissue. Um, and it's also got to be thick enough that you can fit a good sized dissector inside of your tissue to be able to count. So let's say your tissue is 15 microns thick. That's probably thick enough that you can have a two to five micron guard zone on the top and on the bottom. And you can still have a good size, maybe hopefully at least eight to 10 micron dissector um, to be able to count cells. But that's about as thin as I would possibly like it. Obviously thicker would be better. And remember, when we're talking about tissue thickness, we're talking about the mounted, the post-shrinkage, post-processing tissue thickness. So you might need to cut your tissue at 50 or 60 microns thick. Now, that would be the block advance on your microtome or whatever you're sectioning with in order to get it thick enough. Okay, that sounds good. What happens if your tissue is not thick enough, if it's under that minimum thickness that you've recommended? Uh, that's an even trickier question. I think probably the best thing to do is to reach out and, and contact our support team because we'd be happy to help you in that case. Awesome. That sounds good. All right. Next question we have here. Let me see. Um, Allison asks, my tissue bleaches quickly. Can I still count cells with Stereo Investigator? Yes, you can. Uh, typically, when you're dealing with fluorescence and you have a lot of tissue that's, that's bleaching very quickly, um, the best thing to do is to acquire what are called SRS or systematic random sampling image stacks. So rather than counting from the live image the way we showed in this webinar, you would open up Stereo Investigator and then you would go through the SRS image stack workflow, which would allow you to acquire an image stack at each site. And now, instead of counting from the live image, which can often, if you're dealing with fluorescence, bleach out too quickly to be able to count cells, um, you'll be counting from image stacks. So those will be acquired and you'll have all the time that you need to go back and, and look at them and review them. There are a few more steps in that process. So I do recommend familiarizing yourself with stereology uh, using some sort of either stable tissue or even bright field work before you dive into SRS image stacks. Um, but there is a fantastic tool that's included with Stair Investigator as long as you buy the image stack module um, that will allow you to count tissue that's, that's unstable like that. And you can always reach out to us with questions about that. And we offer training as well. So we're happy to go through that um, with you um, to go through that process. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, I think that wraps it up for our questions for today. And a couple other links, um, you know, if you if you need help, um, reach out to us um, on our website, uh, mbf.com. 
call mb at bioscience.com slash live support and we'll see that and we'll be able to connect to you and assist you. There's also a great resources in the uh, stereology.info website. Uh, a lot of really good material um, on different probes and, and things like that and some, some great information in the forum, of course. Um, so yeah, and I think that pretty much wraps things up. Um, Thank you all for joining us. It's really a privilege to work with each of you and, and just be a small part of the incredible work that, that everyone's doing. Um, it's especially now, it's, it's a really tricky time. It's, it's not easy. We're, you know, juggling schedules and, and working remotely. And, and I know people are kind of trying to figure out lab time and things like that. And um, it's just, it's tough. And, and we're all, we're all working to, to get where we need to be. So if you need help, let us know. If you're running into trouble, let us know. Um, we'll, we'll help you however we can. Um, if you'd like more information about Starry Investigator, uh, please contact us, uh, info at mbfbioscience.com. Again, we've got the forum. It's a great place to collaborate and look up for uh, questions that you may have. And then we do have a survey app at the end of this. Um, so please fill that out. We'd love to hear from you what went well for the uh, webinar, what, what didn't go well, or if you have additional questions, please send those over. If there's other um, topics you'd love us, you'd like us to cover in a webinar, um, that's good to hear as well. So thank you again, everybody. Ira, thanks for a great job today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Nate. All right, take care, everybody.